Welcome to AUSA's Army Matters Podcast, focusing on what's important to the total Army community. We bring vital Army conversations and interviews on issues relevant to soldiers, military families, and all of you amazing Army supporters. Rotating each week, our show includes Soldier Today, Army Real Talk, Family Voices, and Thought Leaders. Let's tune into the show. Welcome to today's Association of the United States Army Thought Leader Podcast on fires in the Indo-Pacific. This is Colonel Retired Dan Roper, AUSA's Director of National Security Studies. I'll be serving as your host. To address this subject, we're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Thomas Carrico, the Senior Fellow with the International Security Program and the Director of the Missile Defense Project at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where he focuses on national security, missile defense, nuclear deterrence, and public law. He received his PhD from Claremont Graduate University and his BA from the University of Dallas. He's also currently a fellow with the Institute for Politics and Strategy at Carnegie Mellon University. Most importantly, when Tom discusses the issue of fires, those of you who have been privileged to listen to his podcast before, no doubt have been very impressed with his calling upon the expertise of distinguished military theorists such as the Big Lebowski, Marie Kondo, and Frank Costanza in his Festivus Grievances. Tom, we can't wait to hear what you've got to tell us today. Welcome to Thought Leaders. Well, hey, great to see you, Dan. And also, I would just say it was great to be at the big AUSA annual conference in October. Saw so many friends and great to see folks out and about again. Thanks, Tom. That was a big event for all of us, and we're looking forward to much more of that in the future. One can't pick up a newspaper today without hearing about the importance of the Indo-Pacific region to the United States' interests and about myriad challenges to a free and open Indo-Pacific emanating from China, the pacing threat to the United States. Well, these challenges span across all the spheres of diplomacy, information, economics, and military. Naturally, we'd like to focus a little bit on the military domain and drill down into what is arguably the most talked about aspect of the military challenge in the region. Namely, how do we understand the region through the lens of fires that occur that can be offensive and defensive that span the areas of air and missile defense and long-range fires? and how this relates to something known as the anti-access area denial problem, meaning how does the U.S. project its capabilities and influence into the region. So could you describe the challenges we see in the Indo-Pacific region and their broader implications for the U.S. military? As the last administration has said, as the Biden administration's interim national security guidance has indicated, obviously China and Russia are, as you said, the pacing threats. This is what the last national defense strategy called the central challenge of our time. And that document in 2018 called out, you know, advanced capabilities. I read that as kind of a euphemism for hypersonic and other kinds of missile threats, as well as other things. And that's a particular purchase in an Indo-PACOM because it's a big place. It's a big place with lots of water and the tyranny of distance, as they say, is the kind of thing that you want to be able to traverse and reach out and hold things at risk over that large distance. As you also said, of course, it's not just about the military. That's our focus today. But, you know, things like trade and diplomacy, I'll just say the AUKUS deal with Australia is tremendous. But what you recognize there is folks like our Japanese allies and our Australian allies, they kind of recognize that this is a a life and death question for them. This is, I don't like to use the word existential threat. It gets used too often. But for Australia and Japan, this is an existential threat to their way of life. And the kind of cooperation that the United States is doing and has been initiated, is underway with especially those and some other close friends in the region, I think is going to be central. It's also central, by the way, to the fires discussion that we're having, both in terms of the long-range strike, anti-ship missiles, anti-ship capabilities of different kinds, and then also the air and missile defense challenge. So very important, I would say, cooperation going on there, and that's a good sign. Drilling down on that a little bit, could you talk about the importance of the air and missile defense portfolio to the joint force And then further on, the specific implications for the Army supporting the combatant commander within that air and missile defense in the Indo-PACOM. Well, I think the why does air and missile defense matter in this particular context? Well, you know, folks say that the enemy gets a vote. In this case, they've already voted, and they voted with the financial investments and capability developments that they have. And I think it was General John Rafferty, head of the LRPF cross-functional team, who said that we're facing projectile-centric adversaries. And I think that's a good way to look at it, both for Russia and for China. I think it was the former acting defense secretary, Pat Shanahan, who a couple years ago said that the A-280 challenge, 
or rather where our enemies are investing is disproportionately on the missile side of things, as opposed to really exquisite fighters and all this kind of stuff. To be sure, China is doing all kinds of platforms, but I tend to think about the A2AD challenge and the military aspects of Indo-PACOM as disproportionately a missile-rich challenge. So from that standpoint, what has the several services been doing over the past several years? They've been changing our operational concepts with a focus on things like distribution, mobility, deception, right? Move and hide. Move and hide so that you complicate the surveillance and targeting problem and those missiles never reach their target. That's really good passive defense, some active measures there as well, but that's a really good first step to contend with that. Why is active air and missile defense critical? Why was it one of the top modernization priorities when General Milley rolled those out in 2016, 2017 timeframe? Well, because there's certain things you can't move or hide. And for those, you're going to need active defense, be it air bases, be it four bases of other kinds. And so that's where the threat is. We don't get a, a veto on that. And that extends not just merely from the scuds of yesteryear. No, this is the mud to space problem. This is the UAVs, low and slow, they get the cruise missiles and the increasingly maneuverable ballistic things to gliders and scramjets. And yes, <laughs> orbital bombardment as well. So it is a full spectrum problem. And we have to find the full spectrum of ways to deal with that. Before we jump to the long-range precision fires aspect, could you drill down a little further on an aspect of something you just raised and talk about the discussions and the misunderstandings that exist regarding, as an example, missiles that travel at hypersonic speeds and what their significance is in the threat that we're talking about? Well, look, I think over the past several years, each of the several services, and this really dates back to the Obama administration. When the Obama administration, the latter part of it, I think Ash Carter would have been the secretary at the time, was looking around and realized post-Ukraine, both South China Sea activities, that we needed to be doing something different. That Our C2 focus wasn't going to carry forward in the same way. And so that's where you begin to see not merely these new operational concepts begin to germinate, but also investments in what we call now hypersonic strike of different kinds. It's defense-wide, but each of the several services is doing this. And I like to think about hypersonic missiles as just the future of missiles. And I think 10 years from now, we're not going to talk about hypersonic as a specific thing. We're just going to talk about missiles. And as the technology advances, as it becomes more widespread, I think it's just going to be a new generation. Of course, there are some technical differences here. These tend to be more endo-atmospheric in the atmosphere as opposed to the ballistic reentry vehicles that are way outside and then coming back down. And they also, by virtue of gripping the high part of the atmosphere, they've got a whole lot more maneuverability. And so they don't have that predicted impact point and that predictable trajectory that a ballistic or artillery thing would have. And that makes it, as I like to say, a very complex air defense challenge. You don't have the discrimination problem of sorting out the ballistic reentry vehicle from lots of chaff and clutter and countermeasures in vacuum in space. You've got a different problem, and that's fundamentally the maneuverability. That's an air defense challenge. The good news is we're good at air defense. We've got to get better sensors and the like to get after it. But this next generation of missilery will force us to adapt our air missile defense architecture in terms of both sensors and also interceptors. So given that challenge and the potential opportunity to address it and perhaps even overcome it, let's talk a little bit about the proactive way to get after some of these challenges. And that's the portfolio of long-range fighters in the case where we do have adequate sensors and an adequate ISR, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance network and system that can feed into what we hear talked about in joint all-domain operations and Army's multi-domain operations, that any sensor to the best shooter through the right headquarters, that's what we're all working toward. So could you describe the challenge of Army long-range precision fighters as part of the joint context? Because it's not being done for the Army, it's being done for the Joint Force Commander. Yeah. So just to break it down to the fundamentals, I see the long-range fires, both hypersonic and subsonic, that are being built and invested in across the joint force, each of the several services. The demand signal for that is growing. And the demand signal for that is growing, I'd say, really in terms of the decision space being shortened and the ability of our adversaries to construct and to build really coordinated attacks that would happen simultaneously or in a very short window of time. And so likewise, the overall window is going to be relatively brief. Now, there's a whole conversation here in part about you know, reframing the discussion as missile defeat rather than missile defense. And there's a whole kind of corollary controversy connected to that about left of launch. And people get nervous when they start talking about left of launch as preemption, nervous from a kind of policy point of view. But of course, 
we ought to think about these things, not as preemption and that sort of policy baggage that comes with that, but right of the first launch and left of the rest. <laughs> so the conflict has started. At that point, you should do your very darndest to try to find out and schwack things on the ground that haven't left the rails yet. You won't be able to get all of them, but you hopefully can get some of them there to alleviate the burden on your active air missile defenses. Did you know, as a member of AUSA, you have access to many benefits? From car rental to entertainment discounts, the opportunities are ample. Visit www.ausa.org slash benefits to learn more. So to help our listeners understand these concepts, which again, there's a multidimensional way of trying to understand how all the pieces fit together of these very complicated and complex portfolios and addressing the complicated and complex challenges. Could you talk about, pick a place in the Indo-Pacific theater, you know, a physical location where we can kind of see how all this comes together in a way it may work or the way it's intended to work, bringing together the offensive and defensive fires and air and missile defense and the long-range ground-based yeah. fires. Well, look, Indo-Pacific, that is kind of the center of the world right now. And to stay with kind of the joint hat, I'm very fond of quoting General Berger, Commandant of the Marines. He's the one who said a couple of years ago that we're kind of witnessing the emergence of a new era of missile warfare, right? And that's kind of how I put together the pieces of the investments from subsonic to hypersonic, ours and theirs, our friends, our adversaries, and ourselves. And to the specific point of, okay, how does that congeal in Indo-PACOM? Well, you see that with what the Navy and the Air Force are doing and their investments. And as it applies to the Army, I think especially the multi-domain task force, and really the center of the world here is Guam. And Guam, I think, may turn out to be a really important test case and maybe the most important kind of operational test bed for putting these things together. And don't take my word for it. Don't, frankly, take the Army's word for it. Listen to the last two Indo-PACOM commanders, both <laughs> Navy admirals who have been pounding the table, calling for 360-degree air and missile defense because you can't move and hide Guam. And, oh, yes, also ground-based fires. And so it's fascinating to me to see the Marines pursuing tomahawks. So is the Army getting tomahawks on a truck? But likewise, I think it was General Berger who just the other day said, you know, we might need to look into the ground-based hypersonic strike of various kinds. The Marines, right? Kind of imagine them fitting into a backpack or something. It has to be mm -hmm. something a little bit different. I think you're going to see a lot of experimentation. And as we think an exercise and experiment with offense-defense integration stuff, Guam, I think, is going to be the center of the world. Why? Because that's where we do a whole lot of force projection from. We've got to protect a relatively small number of critical nodes. If we can't defend that, then our force projection comes back quite a bit <laughs> into the Pacific. Yeah, that's a huge potential Achilles heel that also can be a huge force multiplier if we bring these things together in the manner that you suggest. Is there any last thing you'd like to pass on to our listeners about the connection between what we've discussed between long-range fires missiles that attain hypersonic speeds, and the role of land power in the Indo-Pacific. Because in the macro sense, one looks at a globe, sees an awful lot of water, and some draw the assumption that maybe land power writ large is not as significant. Just please try to help our listeners understand how you see the role of land power in the joint fight yeah. in what is, as you've stated, it's the number one priority of our Defense Department to be prepared for. Right. Well, look, uh, just to reiterate, Multi-domain fires means multi-domain. This is a very hard challenge. We can't do all this just from the air or just from sea. We're up against some adversaries that are very robust, and it will truly require, I believe, massing fires from all three domains, space as well perhaps, but at least those three domains uh, in the near term so that we can truly complicate their calculus and complicate their surveillance and targeting. We do not want to present the situation of a destabilizing small number of targets that they can decapitate as work. But a couple other things. You know, we're in this conversation in part because the United States just withdrew from the INF Treaty two years ago. We wouldn't be having this conversation in part if we didn't. China was never a party to that treaty. The reasons for that withdrawal were very much about Russian malfeasance and Russian violation. But the deeper cause that forced the United States to need to act on those reasons, as opposed to just ignoring it, is because we faced this capability gap and yes, we're up against folks like China who never had this restriction in the first place. I give the Army a lot of credit. I love the fact that they stood up again the 56th Field Artillery Command, the specific command that was the pre-INF command in Europe, 
Uh, I'm not sure what the appropriate thing would be in the Pacific, but the demand signal for that's going to be being important. Let me also just bring it back to the Allies question as well. This isn't just an American idiosyncrasy. We are in the Pacific with our allies, and frankly, that's an asymmetric advantage that our Chinese friends do not have. And so to make sure that we're exploiting that to the fullest extent, we need to make sure that we're getting capability out to the Australians, to the Japanese, in every way we can. Make sure that nothing stands in the way of that. Whether that be the INF Treaty, that's gone. Good. Whether it be the missile technology control regime that has in the past sometimes at least slowed down the transfer of critical missile-related capability. We want to make sure that nothing stands in the way. Because again, as Admiral Davidson, head of Indo-PACOM, has pointed out, time is short, and we're talking about mid-2020s to deter, you know, ultimately want to deter the kind of threats that they're seeing coming down the line. Thanks, Tom. We'd like to thank Dr. Tom Carrico for being with us today and explaining the role of fires, both offensive and defensive, in the Indo-Pacific and for sharing his insights on an initiative that is so important to our country and our allies and our partners in the entire Indo-Pacific region. We will look forward to keeping apprised of your continued efforts in this area, and we look forward to talking to you sometime in mid-2022 after we've seen the national security strategy, the national defense strategy, and a number of strategies with which he's intimately involved that will help really paint the picture in more detail. He's shown the outlines of the paint-by-numbers We'll understand a little bit more what's in between those numbers at that point in time and compare it to budgets and understand where we're moving forward in a coherent manner and where we're taking risk. And again, risk is not just for the U.S. Army, for the U.S. military, but all those countries that we're so close to and dependent on. So again, we look forward to talking to you in 2022 as we're moving forward in this critical area. Well, thank you, Dan. And again, appreciate the opportunity, the invitation to come on. Thanks, Tom. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters Podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters Podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at Have a great Army Day. Hua.